Okay, so what I'd like to do um, today is to begin thinking about how the Reformation fragmented almost from its opening moment. One of the issues that we had a chance to talk briefly about uh, last week is the person of Martin Luther, a person around whom the narrative of the Reformation puts as the great figure, the founder. But we also had a chance to, to hint at something I'm going to talk about today, that he was also an extremely divisive figure. And one of the reasons he was most divisive was his self-identity. He saw himself, I don't, oh, I forgot to take this off. Uh, he saw himself as a prophet, frequently drawing the connection with Elijah, very, very um, self-consciously. But the problem was, although many, many people regarded Luther as a prophetic figure, raised up by God at that particular moment to restore the church, Luther saw himself very much as a, as a prophet at the end of time. No, we often think about Luther as the beginning of a movement that becomes the Reformation, the beginning of Protestantism that's around here 500 years later. That's not how Luther saw the world. He believed that, all, that Satan was in the last battle and that the church as Antichrist had been raised up now in the final days, that Christ would return. This was this apocalyptic vision. And as a result, he saw himself as a prophet of the end times. It's often hard, especially when we look at it 500 years later, and it wasn't the end times. It's hard for us not to be kind of condescending about that, or even ridiculing. There are, and remain to this day, many groups that see the end of time signaling in the world around us. Yet, in some ways, they continue to be disappointed. But I think if we, if we take that attitude, we really risk understanding what people actually believed. And Luther and his followers actually believed that all that was happening in the world, the, the advance of the Ottoman Empire, the Turks from the East, plague, the, the sudden the emergence of Antichrist in the church, which was suppressing the word, all of these things were taken as signs, as portrayed in the book of Revelation which was, for Luther, a very powerful and source of his identity. So the, the point I'm kind of getting at here is that Luther himself saw his person as singular, that he had a special prophetic office. And where that really comes out is in his belief that, God, that it wasn't his person. I mean, there surely was a strong element of, of ego in it. But there's, but there's also a conviction that God was acting through him. I mean, we need to think about you know, all charismatic religious figures, in which in some ways we can find extraordinary faults with. But for many of them, they actually believe that God is acting in them. And that's very serious, and to be taken very seriously. And Luther believed that it wasn't his person that held the authority, but it was God acting in him. But the problem was that already, we talked, we, you looked at the freedom of a Christian from 1520, and I said, you know, 1520 is a crucial year for Luther's ideas and his writings, the most important year 
But he was then a, in hiding for a year when he translated the Bible into German, the New Testament. And while he was away, radicalism broke out in his city of Witt, Wittenberg. That people taking what they believed Luther was said, that you should destroy the godlessness. That that which was idolatrous should be stripped from the church. And they literally attack the churches. They start ripping things out. They attack the vestments of the clergy. They attack the clergy themselves. There is a kind of mob violence motivated by this idea that the church should be made pure, the church should be cleansed, like the cleansing of the temple. And that was what Luther was saying, that Luther's words were a call to action. And this is where the Reformation, from its very origins, becomes not only multi-causal, but it goes down various different routes. Those of us who will belong to certain traditions in Protestantism always, of course, see our path as the true interpretation of the Reformation, but there were multiple interpretations of what reform meant, what liberating the word of God meant, what the church should look like, what Christian society should look like. And those are the kind of fundamental things that I hope we will be able to talk about this week. That Luther and the Swiss reformer Huldrych Zwingli, who is really the founder of the Reformed tradition, had a certain conception of what Reformation should be, and we're going to talk about that. But in the kind of writing of history, those have been taken as normative. And what I want to suggest to you, too, that those were two views within a broader spectrum of what might have happened. And so I've just uh, put up here some of the issues that we're going to be talking about, not just today and, and Wednesday and in sections, but uh, these are going to be continuous questions as we go along. Who pro properly belongs to the church and who does not? Where are the boundaries of the church? And perhaps, of course, the overriding question of all, who interprets the Bible? You put the Bible into the hands of the people. You say all people are equal before God. The word of God is for everyone. Great, great ideal. But what does it look like in the world? What does it look like? when you and I look at the same passages and come to very different interpretations. What do you do? Who is the authority? Well, coming back to Luther, Luther believed as a prophetic, prophetic figure, as Elijah, that he was the decisive voice. Therefore, we see this person who is both the guiding figure of the early Reformation and, in many ways, the source of its fragmentation. Because what happens when others disagree with him? They were vilified. And there were many. People around Luther, as I've mentioned, people across German lands, and particularly I'm going to talk about, and you have readings for this week, Conrad Grable, his letter that we'll talk about, Huldrych Zwingli, the reformer of Zurich, and as I say, the founder of the reform tradition, and a group of figures who, in 1527, write their confession, which is the Schleitheim Confession, which you have part of for this week, a confession of an alternative view of Christian society that rejects what Luther and Zwingli say the church is and rejects their authority and rejects what both Luther and Zwingli did, which was to connect religion with political authority, to create what we would call now a state church, where magistrate and pastor stand side by side. The model for this was, 
king and prophet. David, the king. Nathan, the prophet. Nathan, anointing David. The prophet and king together. We'll talk about this uh, a, a bit more in a moment. But that model... And remember that it was the, the political rulers who saved Luther when he was declared a heretic. In Swiss lands, Huldrych Zwingli creates a church where the governors of the city of Zurich are the head of the church, but with two quite distinct roles. The radicals, and, and one term that gets used, you'll see a lot, Anabaptists for the most part. The term Anabaptist, remember we go back to the, our, our first lecture, who gets to name? Anabaptists never call themselves Anabaptists because Anabaptism means rebaptism, baptizing again. Well, with their powerful conviction of baptism in the Spirit, they're not baptizing again. That's the one true baptism. They reject the idea that the baptism of infants is a real baptism because it's not a baptism of faith. A powerful tradition very much alive today in the churches. But this is the roots of it. And in so holding to that, they fundamentally reject what the reformers like Luther and Zwingli said that baptism into the church is an infant. We'll talk about why Zwingli is a founder of the reformed tradition, places that within the, the context of the entry into the covenant. And the connection they make with the Hebrew Bible is that baptism is the equivalent of circumcision. It marks the entry into the covenant of God and that the parents take the promises on, beyond, beyond behalf of the child. The radicals that emerge 1522, 1523, so very early in the Reformation, say, where in the Bible is infant baptism? Christ in the Jordan, John baptizing in the Jordan, Book of Acts, we don't see it anywhere. It's not scriptural. You're telling us that scripture alone is authoritative, and then you declare there should be infant baptism when there's no place in scripture where there's warrant for it. So this is part of the divide. That, that. But there are others. The model of the church that comes out of Luther and Zwingli is, as I said, like the state church. Church, polit politicians standing together with the church. And that meant that as a member of the church, you were also a member of the political community. You were both. You were citizen and Christian at the same time. And both flew, uh, flowed from each other. You were two things at the same time. Well, these radical voices are going to say, no. The political world is fallen, it's compromised, it's dirty, it's corrupt, it's fundamentally ungodly. And they set this idea that politics and Christianity cannot have anything to do with each other. That what you, but the church should remain pure. And this connects with the idea of baptism. That the church, that baptism of faith is into a community that seeks, like the early disciples, to keep the church pure, unsullied by political affairs. And that's, going, that's what you see in the Schleitheim article of 1527. This vision of a separate, pure church completely opposite to what Luther and Zwingli are saying. They're saying that the church involves the whole community, and of course it, it encompasses both believers and non-believers. All members are bar part of the church. And what they say, it is not for the church to decide who is a believer and who is not. God alone knows that. 
God alone knows who actually believes. The affairs of the heart cannot be for the earthly church, the visible church, to decide. So you get, right from the beginning, two very different visions of what the church is. Is it a, compl- a mixed body of all people who, attem- who are required to attend church and follow the mandates of the state and to follow the Christian teachings on, of morality and conduct, who are to bring their children to the church to be baptized, who are to, those children are to be educated in the church until they can become full members as, as adults, which meant in the early modern world 13, 14 years old, perhaps even younger. That's one vision. But at the same time, and drawing from the same Bible, and often people who at the beginning were close friends, Conrad Grebel was, a, was at one time a close friend of Huldrych Zwingli. But these issues ripped apart those friendships. So the early mo- uh, early, this early period is shaped by a great deal of tumult, not only theological division, not only division over what constitutes the church, but there is a a period of social and economic unrest, particularly in the rural areas, the peasantry, who were resentful of the largely urban elites. who were profiting enormously from their labor. This, in the 16th century, you have what is still essentially a feudal society. That which leads to the most tumultuous event, which happens in 1525, which is the Peasants' Revolt, which involves hundreds of thousands of people. Remember, this is a culture when 80 to 90% of people live in rural areas. Only a relatively small number. And you, here you just have an image, you can see in the different uh, colors here, how widespread, almost down to Venice, right up towards the north of Germany. But the intense areas are right around here, right close to where the Swiss-German border is. The, what's the area known in Germany as the Black Forest. This area, uh, monasteries were ransacked, cities were burnt, enormous amount of violence fueled by a powerful anti-clericalism, opposition, hatred even of the clergy who were seen as profiting from the labors of the people. But also, they heard Luther talking about the freedom of a Christian as being liberation from their social and economic oppression. They believed that the freedom of the gospel was liberating in this world. They went into battle holding up signs holding up flags and banners in which the words of the gospel or Luther's uh, words were written. Here's just an image of the brutal suppression of the peasants. Literally, tens of thousands of peasants were put to death by the the armies of the rulers, princes. And remember, the church is also at this point also a territorial ruler. So monasteries held large lands on which serfs labored. Bishops and cardinals of the church were also territorial. They were also political leaders. So there's huge hostility against the church as an economic ruler in the lands. And the church is part of the suppression. The consequence of this, 
The consequence of this comes from Luther's own rejection of the claims of the peasants. He writes a famous and very um, invictive work in which he brutally denounces social rebellion as a result of the Reformation. When Gabriel Warnock was here a couple of years ago, I think 2017, and he preached in the chapel, it was the year of the Reformation anniversary, he pointed out in Marquand that the peasants' reformation, uh, oh, sorry, the peasant revo revolution and Luther's response to this was a defining moment but also an extremely dark moment for the emergence of Protestantism. That at that moment it declared that the gospel was not socially liberating. Luther sided with the princes, and that fundamentally changed the Reformation. It meant that the Reformation was no longer going to be a movement from below, as you might say, from the people. The Reformation was going to become something that was imposed from the South, so, so that the political rulers would be the implementers. The political re rulers and the reformers would be the implementers of change, of religious change. They would set the terms of it. So 1525, when this revolt, is a moment in which the Reformation changes character. And that's something we're going to talk about again. We'll look, talk about Calvin's Geneva and what sort of arrangement there. But it also has an enormous impact on the Reformation in that it creates enormous amount of radicalism of those people who hold to the gospel, who hold actually to many of the things that Luther said, but had, a as I say, a completely different view of what Christian society should look like. Here's just uh, a slide that brings us back to the early part of, of this movement, right back to Luther's own origins, 1521, 1522. And one of the, the point I just want to make here is that one of the points that stands at the center of this radicalism is the need to cleanse the church of all images, statues, altars, these were seen as idolatrous. So the notion of what constitutes idolatry, what constitutes idolatry, and the interpretation of the commandment of graven images is central to the story of the Reformation. I've talked about this. And where that takes place dramatically is in the Swiss city of Zurich, which in itself is not a particularly remarkable place, but it becomes a re following Wittenberg in, in Germany, it becomes the second place of the Reformation, and it becomes the founding, as I say, of the Reformed tradition. Zwingli, as I've already uh, indicated, holds to many of the same views as Luther on justification by faith alone, the authority of the Bible, but also this vision of the Christian church as incorporating the whole community. But he differs from Luther in several fundamental ways. And here we see a major issue of the Reformation. Luther and Zwingli looked at the text in the Gospel of John when Christ says, this is my body, and they come to completely different understanding of what Christ said or what he meant. Very, very briefly, Luther saw in it, continuing the medieval tradition, that it argued for a physical presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, in the bread and wine. Now, he does not go as far as transubstantiation that the, a kind of real transformation, 
a physical in the sense that you are actually touching the body of Christ and drinking his blood. But nevertheless, he says that Christ is physically, there is a physicality of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. Zwingli takes a different view. He is more influenced by a kind of Pauline dualism, you might say, between, of a distinction between body and spirit, spirit and material. He sees the two as quite separate. And what lies at the heart of this, and this is uh, important for a number of reasons, but, uh, but many of the radicals actually adopt Zwingli's view of the Eucharist. And he argues that God cannot, that following the incarnation of Christ and Christ's uh, rising at the resurrection to the right hand of the Father, as the Creed says, that Christ is no longer physically present in the world. He is present only through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there, and that God cannot be communicated to the faithful through material means. God, as Zwingli constantly said, is spirit and must be worshipped in spirit. So you have two very different views of the physicality of God's presence in the world. Both are arguing that God and Christ are present in the world, but the question is, is he physically, materially present? Luther says yes, Zwingli says no, but the thing is they're looking at exactly the same biblical text. That brings up, of, this becomes one of the most uh, fundamental divisions of the Reformation. It seems hard for us in many ways to, to get our minds into why does this matter? Why should this be a source of division? But it goes back, if we had more time to talk about it, to representing two fundamentally different views of the world. It's, it's a kind of symbol for two different views of Christianity. So what, this comes back to my sort of opening point. There is already in the 1520s, remember we only started in 1517 with Luther's 95 Theses, already by the mid-1520s, less than 10 years later, these very different views of what constitutes reform they can all agree the church needs to be reformed. They can all agree that the Bible is the source of that reform. They can agree that one is justified through Christ in faith. But those convictions lead to very different visions. Zwingli's view, which is along the line of many of the radicals, and it's important to, to note that many of the radicals, including Conrad Grable that you, that you have uh, the letter from, come out of a close circle of friends around Zwingli. And they believe, much like the followers of Luther, that they're actually being faithful to what he said. They say that when he then hands the church over to the political authorities, it's he who betrayed the gospel, not them. They held to the original principles of the Reformation, faith alone, a church that is purified, and a community of believers. Zwingli compromised this in their view. And for instance, when he talked about the stripping of the churches, they started doing it. Here's just one image from, uh, they start a famous incident where a very large crucifix, you don't see it on here, you just see the cross, the, crucif the body of Christ has been removed already. They start tearing down symbols of the Catholic Church. They start attacking the church and stripping things out, taking, knocking over um, statues, wiping the altars clean of ornaments, all sorts of things. So there's one of the things I want to stress is there's enormous amount of violence in the early Reformation. 
not only between people, but violence against images of God. Here we see an idea where the, the churches are being stripped and the fire where the images are being destroyed. Sorry, just a quick thing. There's a book. I'm doing a, I've done a book which will appear in October on Swing So if I seem slightly obsessed, it's because it's been on my mind for a while. <laughs> so this notion of what constitutes pure witness. What is purity of faith. Zwingli and Luther say it can be through the visible community of church and of the world, whether it's a city or a state. Those are manifestations of the Christian society because the Christian society is full of people who both believe and do not believe. And as I say, it's around Zwingli that we have the most dramatic break. And those are the readings that you have uh, for this week. Both of them come out of Swiss context. Grebel, as I say, was in Zurich, and he was very close to Zwingli until they part ways. The Schleitheim, Schleitheim is just a small village outside of Zurich where the so-called Anabaptists met to have a gathering and a man named Michael Sattler writes this confession which tries to draw together their beliefs. You can see here during the 25 period Anab Anabaptism really starts in 1525. Uh, That's when the first secret adult baptisms take place which is illegal. So they start already from the beginning, make themselves illegal figures who are going to be persecuted. But you can see within a period of 25 years that just in the German lands alone, how much it's spreading. And I just want to talk in, in Munster here in the north is where a particularly scandalous event takes place that I'm going to talk about uh, on Wednesday. So this spreads like wildfire. This reminds us that the teaching of Luther and Zwingli and their colleagues has to be set against the idea that radical visions, just to use that uh, term loosely, is also spreading very quickly. There are many voices here. The voices of the Anabaptists, however, will quickly turn into the persecuted. Here, this is a 17th century drawing. This is back in the city of Zurich. And one of the first leaders of the Anabaptists, a man named Felix Manz, M-A-N-Z, who advocated the separation of church and state and who advocated ad adult baptism. He was himself baptized as an adult, after, so rebaptized, or depending on how you want to see it, uh, in 1525 and was baptizing others. One of the things about these, the Anabaptists, they don't really have ordained uh, priests. They have a belief that the, in the community of believers, all can preach and all can administer the sacrament together, which is generally portrayed as a meal of fellowship. But what's also interesting in this is, is that women have a very prominent role in the 1520s radical movements. They are frequently preachers. And if you look at the, the most famous book of martyrs, um, whose name has just escaped me, um, the, the Martyr's Mirror, Martyr's thank you so much. Uh, you have many accounts of women as central to this movement. But here, Felix Mance, in 1527, is being put to death. He's being drowned in the river. Drowned because this was meant to be a kind of mockery of the fact that they were rebaptizing. If you're going to rebaptize, you will give you a third baptism. So here you just see a, so he's being pulled back into the. This is important. <coughs> 
because this is the moment when the Protestant Reformation Church actually becomes a persecuting church. It starts putting to death those people who differ from it. And so many of these, which has the effect, as it often does, of simply spreading the radical movement even further, even more fervently. And they say now, what's the difference between Zurich and Wittenberg and Rome? We thought we had left that church, and now the church, which saw itself as the restoration of the gospel, is persecuting, it's putting to death people who disagree with it. This is a you know, complex part of the Reformation we're going to... Uh, continue to think about. And amongst these radicals, it, it, they're a very diverse uh, group, and of course within them they hold a variety of different views, so I'm having to, to gloss over a lot of differences. But there are certain things that they identify themselves with, and I've just put these here. They see themselves, particularly after the death of, of several of the Anabaptists by drowning. Others were put to death by both Catholic and Protestant forces. They start to see martyrdom as one of their core identities. And martyrdom, in course, w in line with biblical figures such as Stephen. The book of Acts is very, very important uh, for... Uh, the, the radicals, of course, because that is the model of the early church. But, of course, it's also the story of Pentecost, the fire of the Spirit. And that's, that fire, that baptism in the Spirit, that, that baptism of faith is the true baptism. And without a statement of faith, you cannot be a true Christian. And this is the origin of the traditions where, of conversion stories, of testimonials, of baptism, baptism of fire and of the Spirit. And as I've already mentioned, they saw themselves in the model of the disciples as very egalitarian, breaking down social, political differences, but also gender differences. Not all, but you know, there's, of course, there are differences, in, but there is a strong tendency. So the letter that you have, or at least a, 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 one letter, and, and I, I just put in the email, just look at the first one, 93. This is from Conrad Grable, writing from Zurich to a famous German revolutionary and opponent of Luther, and he's writing to say how much this figure, Thomas Munzer, is influencing in them and how much they are in agreement in what constitutes the true church. I'm not going to, to read through this, but just to point out the, the, the centrality of acts, of baptism. But here he talks about infant baptism, baptism as blasphemy, abomination, contrary to all scripture. It's contrary, and this is an interesting point, contrary to both the papacy, but also to the reformers, and sort of basically saying the reformers are no better than the papists. They're just a new version of it. It's the image of Thomas Munzer. He was also a leader in the Peasants' War of 1525. He's captured after a battle, brutally tortured, and put to death. <coughs> in the last a little bit, I want to talk about the Schleitheim, the challenging word. Just, it's a small village in the Swiss countryside outside of, of Zurich. 1525, 1526, 1525 are when the first adult baptisms start, 1526. With that, you have the emergence of a of distinctive groups who define themselves, as I've said, around the baptism of the faithful, who gather together, but they're driven from the churches and they're driven from the city by the political authorities and by the reformers. So many of them are meeting in secret. They meet in forests. The movement in many ways goes underground, but it flourishes. 
and very much at the heart of it, as I've said, is this idea of recreating the church of the New Testament, which, of course, includes persecution. They're driven from what we might call the mainstream of society to become people who live on the margins. But across German-speaking lands and into Italy, these, communi these commu uh, communities build a network of connections. And it's in here that one of these figures, a man named Michael Sattler, who himself would become a martyr, comes into the Swiss lands where all these people are flourishing in communities, although they are largely underground or in hiding. And they have a large number of different views. One of the more controversial of many of their views were two things. Because they rejected the state and because uh, it, was it was standard in early modern society, even as we can identify uh, in many, well, in, in America, to, to a certain extent, that, be, that you swore an oath to the state of loyalty and obedience. And that was an identity marker of belonging to the state. Well, one of the ways the, the Anabaptists or the radicals indicated the fact that they believed that the community of the faithful should be separate from the state is they refused to take these oaths. And for that, of course, they were made criminals. But they also refused to take up the sword, and you'll see this in the, in the text that you have at the Shalai Time uh, articles, they refuse to take up the sword. They become pacifists. Now, Thomas Munzer had not been a pacifist. He had advocated, and of course, many in the Peasants' War had advocated violence. This, the Anabaptists that emerge out of the Swiss lands, which are, for many part, I'll mention this on Wednesday, are very much the background to groups such as the Hutterites, the Mennonites, uh, who are very much with us today, their tradition comes largely, though not in completely, but largely out of this Swiss tradition that we're talking about, which itself was pacifist. Think of what you know about Mennonite communities or Hutterite communities. I grew up in, in Manitoba, in Canada, um, very large Hutterite community there, very large Mennonite community uh, there. Many of them had come from Eastern Europe where they were driven by persecution in the 16th and 17th century. They resettled in the East. And then in the 19th and 20th centuries, many of them uh, emigrated to Canada and the United States and Australia. This is, that is the kind of modern day version uh, of the relationship uh, between these origins of the Anabaptist radical movement and their visions of society. Think of the separation of Mennonites from society. But think also, uh, this is why I put the article in from the Washington Post, think also of the legacy of separation of church and state. So, so much a part of the discourse and narrative in America whether there is or not, of course, not for me to decide, but certainly is hotly debated. That's why, just for as a discussion piece, I put that piece in from, from about a year ago in the Washington Post about education. This debate still lives. At the core of their beliefs of the radicals is, as I saw said, baptism. And it's not just baptism of adults as a sacramental act, but that indicated their profound belief of separation of the church, of the body of the faithful. And one of the things that they implemented 
to do this was excommunication. And we still see that amongst uh, many religious communities today. That those are excluded who are seen to have transgressed the gospel and the norms of those communities. And of course, that will remain an ongoing question, is who is excluded? Who is removed from the church? Can they be brought back? So these are the, kind of, and you'll see that in the document about the Schleitheim article. It's often referred to as the ban, the removal of this. I've just put, um, some of those points are there. But I've just put in the PowerPoint, which is uploaded on Canvas if you want to look at it, but it's also uh, in the text of the Schleitheim article. But some of the key points. See here, baptism shall be given to those who have learned repentance and amendment of life and who believe truly that their sins are taken away by Christ. Who is that? Of course, it has to be a confessing adult. Again, adulthood, uh, the early modern world has no notion of teenagers. The transgression, uh, transition sorry, is from childhood into adulthood. There's, so you are a, an adult and often will marry at 12, 13, 14. So a professing adult in this case, case could be what we would call possibly a young teenager. The separation of the sword, the same point. A separation shall be made from evil and wickedness which the devil has planted in the world, that we shall not have fellowship with the wicked. This idea that the church is separated, a witnessing body that keeps itself pure and does not connect or have relations with the wider body of wicked society. So this notion of separation because they have abominations. So there, there are many other things you can see in this, but if you, if you look at the document, you see these central ideas of baptism, of pacifism, of, of rejecting the oath, so rejecting political society, of separation from the world, but also separation from larger society. And pacifism, as I say, these ideas of what the church is. And you know, for those of you who are familiar with early church history, this is in many ways the story of Donatism and Augustine again. Who belongs to the church? What role does purity, can the Christian community be pure? Is there a kind of moral perfectionism? The reformers, Luther, Zwingli, and others say, no, remember what Luther said, simul justus, simul peccator, at the same time justified, you are a sinner. Christians are still sinners in the world and constantly need reconciliation. There can be no pure church. This vision is, yes, there can be. It's a gathering of the few, held together by baptism and the, the meal, the supper, the feast of fellowship of the Spirit. So who belongs to the church? This is a question we will have uh, again and again. Who constitutes the church? And what possible ways can there be a Christian society?